Let me add the welcome that's already been given to you who are visiting with us tonight, and we're grateful that you're here. And I also want to say a very special word of appreciation to the people we've honored today. Your spirit means so very much to this church. You bring an element of love and openness, and you add so much to helping us love each other. And we thank you so very much for what you mean to our church. We love you and thank God so very, very much for you. I'd like to break into our study in the book of Acts. And tonight, look at John chapter 12, the first seven verses of John 12, very familiar scripture. This, this has to do with our home missions effort this year. I, I think all of us are aware that those days when we used to believe that the United States was a launching pad for mission endeavor are over. Now we see ourselves as very much the object of mission compassion. We live in a land of some 252 million people, and we know that 174 million plus of those people have never given any indication that Jesus Christ is their Savior and Lord. I used to tell people when I was traveling and talking about the ministry at Golden Gate Seminary, where you have a seminary on the West Coast in three locations, in Los Angeles and San Francisco and Portland, that in the Washington, Oregon area, and Jane and I were there for the Baptist Convention uh, in Yakima, Washington this year, those people are serving Christ, the people we have there, are serving Christ in a place where 95% of the population never attend any kind of religious service. In the state of California, there are almost 30 million people. And we know that the vast majority of those, more than 95% of those people are not even members of any kind of religious organization. If California were a nation, it would be the eighth largest nation by population in the world. If California were a nation, it would be number two in gross national product, second only to the rest of the United States in this world. And yet so many, many of those people do not know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And I just couldn't let this home mission season pass. I know you're going to give sacrificially, and I know you're going to pray earnestly, and I know you're concerned about Jackson and about Mississippi and about this nation. But I just wanted us to think again tonight about what it means for us to be involved in home missions. It's not an easy thing. It's not a simple thing. For all the people around us are not like us. We're a nation of 252 million diverse people. There are more than 600 languages spoken in this nation. Many of those people do not speak English. And we must find ways to reach them. They're in hard-to-find places. They're in ghettos. They're in places that many people like you and me never go to. We, we drive around them or over them. We never see those places. Uh, they're, they're found in high-rise apartments. They're found in remote places. And I, I just want us to think tonight about aiming our prayers toward our own dear nation and its salvation and thinking about what we should do to help this land know that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm convinced that we will not have the ability to do foreign missions long if we're not very concerned about home missions and about reaching the people of our land. The theme for home missions this year is a time for extravagance. And I, I'll admit that I've had problems with the theme. Last year I had to prepare a message and it was sent to every pastor in the Southern Baptist Convention under the theme, There is No Hope. And I, I had a hard time with that negative kind of statement because I believe there is hope, but there is no hope for those without Christ. And in that, the theme was right. And have a little bit of problems with the theme, a time for extravagance. For many of us, the word extravagance means to go beyond the bounds, uh, to, uh, to go too far, uh, to be wasteful. Uh, that's really the dictionary definition of extravagance in many people's dictionaries. But also it means that you and I are to be stretched in what we do if we really care. That if we really want this nation to be reached, we're going to have to care so much that we will support the people that go into those hard-to-reach places, that we will support the people who go to those people who are different than us and find some way to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. My friend Charles Fuller this year was commissioned to do the study and to, to send a message out to all of we pastors across the land. And he chose this scripture in John 12. 
and, and talked about a time for extravagance and begins by asking the question, what do you think extravagance is? If someone spends thousands of dollars on a vacation for their family, is that extravagance? If a couple has a child who needs surgery and it costs $82,000, is that extravagance? Even if they only have to spend the $16,000 or so, that is the 20% of that that their insurance doesn't pay, I don't think they would say that's extravagance. Suppose a man would, would buy for someone he loves very much a, a great diamond and he would say, that, that's not extravagance because I love her and I want to do that. You could apply this time after time and ask yourself, when is it extravagance? When do we go out of the bounds? When does it become wasteful? And in this study of John 12, as we read these scriptures, think about the fact that we're going to ask Mary, did you do an extravagant thing? Is this extravagance, this thing that you did? Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Mary, was it extravagant? As she took this, you know what she did. The Word tells us here that she had something. We don't know whether Mary was wealthy or not. We don't know whether this was everything she had or not. But we know she took some perfume that was worth a full year's wages to someone who was a working person. And she brought that in and, and literally in one scripture it says she poured it on Jesus' head and the other she poured it on his feet. She literally gave Jesus this perfume as an offering of her love. And we say, Mary, was this extravagant? Was this some extravagant thing that you did that went beyond the bounds that even seemed wasteful to some, and it did? Was this an extravagant gift? And I think Mary would say no. It wasn't extravagant. Because, you see, extravagance has to do with your values. If you're one who never spends money on any kind of pleasure and you see someone spending money on pleasure, you say, that's extravagant. If you're one who does not believe in spending money on clothing and you see someone wearing nice clothing or, or jewelry, then to you that's extravagance because it has to do with your values. And I'll submit to you that Jesus Christ was so very precious and wonderful to Mary that this was not extravagant because of her values because of her sense of worth, because of the value she placed upon her relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I think she would say, no, this is not extravagant. I'm not expressing extravagance. I'm simply expressing gratitude. That's all. You remember what happened. Mary was the brother of Lazarus. Lazarus was probably the, bed, the breadwinner of that family. He took care of himself and his sisters. And while they took care of the home and all the things there, he was the one who probably brought the food home and the, and the money to buy their substance. And that's the kind of world it was in those days. And Jesus had brought this one back from dead that they loved so very much. And Jesus had been in their homes a great deal, and they knew him well, and they loved him, and he loved them, said the Scripture. So to her, it wasn't extravagance. It was just a way of saying thanks. Remember Andre Crouch saying, how can I say thanks for the things that you've done for me? When your values are such, I think it's very, very difficult to find a way to be extravagant when you're following Jesus Christ. What Jesus did for her 
and the way she expressed this and the way she was saying thanks has some applications for you and me, doesn't it? The Bible says we were dead in trespasses and sins. In Ephesians 2, we're reminded that this world is one vast graveyard. On every tombstone is engraved dead in trespasses and sins. And we've been raised to life in Jesus Christ. We've been given this. We are assured of our salvation. We are given free forgiveness of sins. We have been given so very much. And it's hard to call any kind of gift extravagance, going beyond the boundary or going too far when you understand what a debt we owe to Jesus Christ. It's an expression of gratitude. I think she would say, no, this is not an extravagant gift because I have it in perspective. In verses 2 and following, it says, A dinner was given, and Martha served, and Mary took this pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected, Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was the one who kept the money. Perspective. What's important to you? What's really, really important to you? When Jesus said, don't criticize her for this because the poor you'll always have with you, we know he's not saying it isn't right for us to be concerned about the poor because in many, many places in God's Word, he certainly is. We know he's not saying we're not supposed to care and to feed because he said when we come again, one of the ways that when he comes again, one of the ways that we'll be judged is whether we've fed him when he was hungry, all the people represent him, and fed him when he was thirsty and visited him when he was imprisoned and sick. Uh, we know he cares. But our Lord is saying, where's your perspective? I think one of the reasons that the church of Jesus Christ is so anemic nowadays is because we've lost the perspective that Jesus is talking about here the perspective that people, even more than food, need salvation. And people, more than anything else on the face of this earth, need to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And so many churches have lost that perspective. So many of us are saying, I shall go around, I will do the good thing, but I will ignore the best thing. I will do the things that I ought to do in many ways, but I will ignore the main thing. And our Lord is saying in many ways we've got to make the main thing the main thing once again. And we look around us and realize that when things are in perspective, that the most important thing in this world is for people to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. She was saying, no, I'm not being extravagant. I'm putting this in perspective. The most precious thing to me is my relationship with Christ. The most precious thing for me is to indicate and to show and to demonstrate in some way how much Christ means to me and what it means to me to know him. And this aromatic witness of her love and commitment to Jesus Christ was a witness in that day. It wasn't extravagant. It was in perspective. And there was urgency about it. Look in the first verse. Six days before the Passover. Do you realize what we're saying here? The Passover was just before the cross. The Passover was that time just preceding the cross. That Thursday night, the cross was Friday and then the resurrection Sunday. Six days before that is when this happened. There wasn't much time left. There's some urgency about this. They didn't know it, but this lady was following the leading of God. And Jesus said, I understand what's happening. There is urgency here. Have you ever said one day when I'm more able, I'll do something to help win our world to Christ? One day when I feel a little better or when I'm a little bit more committed or, or maybe one day when I have a little bit more, when I have gotten everything I think I want for my own pleasures, then I'll be concerned about our land and I'll care about people knowing Jesus Christ. I think when we understand that gifts to Jesus Christ of any side are not of size, are not extravagant because there's an urgency in what we're about. We don't know how much time we have. We don't know when he's coming again. We don't know how many people will die and go out into eternity today without Jesus Christ. And somehow we must find ways to get the word to that 174 million Americans 
who have never said, I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. There are many ways to do that. There are many ways that you can serve. Now, there are volunteer places. You can talk to us about serving as long-term volunteers. Some 30,000 or so people are giving themselves in, in volunteer service in home missions across our land. There are some 40 or 50,000 people who are giving themselves in, in just a, a matter of short-term witness and help and, and serving in any way that they possibly can. There are many ways that you can give yourself, and this is not just young people. A lot of retired people are doing wonderful work in home missions and in foreign missions and across our world, and that work is needed and that work is necessary. I know a couple. His name is Steve. He's a football coach in San Antonio. He he followed a calling to be a part of this mission's work in our land and went to Syracuse and started a church across the street from, from Syracuse University in New York. And uh, there the church was going, and Steve began to call home and say, would you please pray that we'd have a pastor? We, we have a church now. We need to have a pastor. And after a while, he called home and said, I've got good news and bad news. He told his dad, the good news is we found the pastor. The bad news is he's me. And then Steve transferred to Golden Gate Seminary, and he's serving now in Pacific Heights in a church, and he's graduated from there. And he's one of those people that God called out of a career of teaching, coaching, and worked him into this most wonderful life that he has now because he understood that even the gift of a life is not extravagant when you understand how urgent it is that Jesus Christ be Lord and Savior to all people. I just wanted us to think about it, to ask ourselves, is it really possible to be extravagant? Is it really possible to give too much to reach the world for Jesus Christ? Not just money. And I pray that we'll meet our $72,000. That doesn't sound extravagant to me for us at all. But I, uh, I pray our nation, our convention will reach the $41 million for the home missions offering. I hope you'll pray that too because, see, this is not Lanyap. Now, this is not extra and above. They get this. They say, boy, we've got some extra money. This is very much a part of the budgeted work of the home mission board. If it doesn't come in, many things have to be simply undone. But to reach all these many, many people who speak many, many languages, who live in hard-to-access places, someone has to go and has to find them. And our Lord, I think, intends us to do that, to be a part of it in any way that we possibly can. You remember that old story of some people who lived off the shore of the ocean where there were some tricky coral reefs and, and great undercurrent and tides that brought ships in and crashed them on the coral reefs and the ships were being broken apart and people were being drowned out of compassion. These people started the life-saving society in their little town. And they bought some lifeboats and they trained themselves and when the ships would break on the reefs a, little mile, a few miles out at sea, then they would get in those boats and they would row, row out there and they would save those people and bring them in and they had a little shack that they had beside of the, of, the, of the ocean there. They had a fire in there with blankets and cots and they would treat the people and help them. They saved a lot of lives. And the word got out about how wonderful this life-saving society was on the East Coast and people began to send money and they began to support that. A lot of things were done wasn't long until they'd built a beautiful clubhouse. And then they were able to import wonderful speakers to talk about life-saving techniques and rowing techniques and boating techniques. And it got to the point where all those people just gathered in the clubhouse and talked about life-saving techniques and being the life-saving society and never went out in the ocean anymore to save the lives of boats that were breaking on the water. We can't be like that. We've got to care. We've got to be involved. We've got to keep doing the things that we're doing and making sure that as many people as possible know the Lord Jesus Christ and that we do all we can to make that possible before he comes. So is there an extravagant gift for that? I think not. I think Mary would say even if this was everything she had, it could well have been. I think Mary would say, no, it's not extravagant. It's not extravagant at all. It's gratitude. It's not extravagant. It's perspective. This is what's important. It's not extravagant. It's urgent. It needs to be done now. And I pray you'll catch that kind of vision too. Our Father, we're grateful to you for the privilege to have our health, to have our lives, to be blessed with more than most of the world can even understand. And, oh God, you've told us to whom much is given, much is required. 
And I pray you will help us to see our land as you see it, to care for it as you do, and then to understand there's just not any way to do too much to do what you want done in loving and reaching the land around us. How I thank you, Lord, for your great grace. How I thank you that you saved us. And for some reason, we were in the place that you sent someone, and they came and told us about Christ. And we're grateful for Gene's testimony tonight about someone who came and shared. And, oh, God, help us to be then agents of that sharing, whether it be our own going or whether it be our giving. Lord, help us do it well. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to invite you tonight to understand that this is a church with an open door, that when this family meets, that our Lord invites all who would come to profess faith in Jesus Christ, to join our fellowship, to let us know God has called you to a particular task, or maybe that you just want to come and say, pray for me, I want to do whatever God wants me to do. I don't know what kind of public commitment you need to make, but I think you do because God's a good father, and he always tells his children what to do if they ask him. And so I pray you'll do that. And you'll say yes. We're going to have this time of invitation. Those of you who would make public decisions while all of us remain seated, why don't you just get up and come to the front and share with us what you want to do to honor our Lord and God. We welcome that. We greet you happily as you come. Let's sing and you come just now.